Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today I have the great pleasure of welcoming back to the channel Ralph Ellis and for the first time welcoming Dr. Robert M. Price to Esoteric Thoughts. Dr. Price, can you start by giving the viewers a bit of a background as to who you are and what you're currently doing? Well, I... Um was uh, like as if this were the title of a 50s sci-fi movie i was a teenage fundamentalist uh, and uh, i was very involved in a conservative baptist church and had many good experiences there and met many terrific people so i, I don't want to vilify that but the days came when i realized i was so intrigued with the Bible and its puzzles, because naturally, as a fundamentalist, you, you're looking at that uh, with fascination. Uh, but I came to the point where I realized that this dogma about the Bible was inhibiting my understanding of the Bible, uh, that if you constantly had to slam on the brakes and say, boy, this doesn't look good. It's it's like an apparent contradiction, but uh, that can't be. I, I guess I'll have to wait to heaven uh, until I get to heaven when they have a big seminar on Bible contradictions and the <laughs> angels will say, okay, now I, I know you always wonder about this one. Here's the answer. And say, why didn't I realize that day is never going to come? Or should I say it's already here if you drop the blinders? I used to tell uh, adult students that they, I would talk about the documentary hypothesis of this, the historical Jesus, that, and they'd say, why did we never hear this in church? I was, well, because the pastor uh, didn't want to get fired. Uh, but uh, there are answers to these questions. You just may not like them. Uh, but if your goal is to understand it, then you got to press on. Well, that's what I did. And uh, over the decades, I've been studying this stuff for nigh on to half a century, uh, I uh, found it was, uh, I lost my faith. But I, I penetrated deeper and deeper into the Bible and religious studies. I love both now. I don't hate religious people, anything like that. But uh, to me, the, the most pious thing is to understand. And I feel I understand it much better. Well, I no longer have any institutional affiliation. I taught in the religion department of one college and I taught philosophy in another but uh, eventually, I just sort of, in effect, retired from that. I, I would have gone further, but I was getting too old anyway. I'm 68 now. And uh, I just got sick of the terrible quality uh, of the students. They weren't stupid, but they had been ill prepared. And I couldn't really ask them to do a research paper. Uh, it wasn't their fault, but you know, it was kindergarten. So um, now what I do is uh, teach through podcasts and books. That way, uh, nobody is listening to me or reading uh, my stuff that, uh, that has to do. If they're my audience, it's because they're interested in these things as I am. I don't have to grade them, anything like that. Uh, but uh, there are people who are curious, as I was curious, and I like to uh, pass uh, information and perspectives on to them to, to enrich their own synthesis. I'm not trying to convince them of anything I happen to think, but I, I feel like if I can throw new things into the mix, that will help the ongoing quest for knowledge about this stuff. So I write books, I do podcasts, and uh, I write articles and do columns and all sorts of things, which is great, great fun. And Ralph, since we last spoke, I saw, and correct me if I'm wrong, that some of your books are now being published in Chinese. Is that correct? Uh, to to me, yes. Yeah. Um, not now, actually. They, they've been uh, published in China for over 10 years. So, oh, we get things. Actually, they're quite a good editions, actually. Xiang uh, Tang Man which happens to be Jesus last of the Pharaohs. <laughs> so um, yeah, I've been published in China 
uh, for about 15 years, but we've had a problem recently. This is um, Solomon, Pharaoh of Egypt. Mm. Um, they've had a bit of a pogrom against anything foreign in China mm. um, in the last two, three years, and they've kicked out all of the English teachers. Every single one had to leave the country. Um, so uh, there's been quite large changes and there's been a bit of a crackdown on Christianity and so on. And so my books got caught up in that. And so they've all been unfortunately taken off the shelves. So you won't see them there anymore. But um, they um, they made some very good um, editions. It's um, well illustrated, um, all in Mandarin. And they also made Korean copies as well, which were mm. very good. So they were, they were fairly big in Korea too. So yeah, quite a lot of influence here and there around the world. They want, I think they were looking for alternative opinions on Christianity and Judaism because they don't understand it very much over there. And so to them, it was very interesting to see alternate opinions um, on the Judaic story. So yeah, I became quite big in China for a while. Wouldn't they, shouldn't they see what you're doing is in their interests? Because you're not trying to attack anything, but they would kind of perceive it that way and like it. Um, yeah, you, you would have thought so. Um, but it, it didn't create that much of a fuss. Um, I mean, they've been on sale, as I say, for 10, 15 years over there. And um, there were no great protests about it until very recently. Um, so yeah, it, it quietly slipped in under the radar. Nobody sort of noticed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, but that they were very interested. So they were printed there and in uh, South America, in Spain and Italy and various other places. So yeah. So gents, today's topic, one of my favorites, astro theology. Can you talk to us about examples of astrotheology in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament? So, who do you want to fire off with this? Uh, oh, I think you know the topic better than I do. I, I know a few things, but I find it very helpful to hear you first. Okay. Um, well, I've been looking at the astrotheology of uh, the biblical text for a long, long time, because I think it was central to it, um, mainly about the procession of the equinox, which we'll probably mm. come on to later. Um, and, and that sort of alluded to right at the very beginning in Genesis 1, 14, where it says that uh, God said, let there be lights in the heavens above to divide the day from the night uh, and for them to be signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Um, so it's immediately telling us what the role of uh, astrotheology is. It, it's mainly divisions of months, seasons, years, and millennia, because, of course, the procession of the equinox divides history up into, into millennia. Um, so you can identify yourself with a particular great month uh, within the uh, zodiac. And that will immediately tell you where that history came from. So anything to do with bulls, we can start thinking about the great age of Taurus, uh, which was 4,500 to 1750 BC. Uh, and then if people start talking about sheep and shepherds, as they do, of course, within the Old Testament, and the Hyksos shepherd kings, of course, within Egypt, um, then we can suspect that they're talking about Aries, the great month of Aries. That was 1750 BC through to about 10 AD. And so we come up to the New Testament at a very particular time in processional history when Aries turned into Pisces, the great month of Pisces in AD 10. And of course, Jesus went from being a lamb of God into a fisher of men, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. It's all appears to be astrological in nature. And I, I think that was part of the, in fact, an essential component of 
the religion at that time. And we've got a fairly good idea that this is so for the Nazarene. If I can just do a quick screen share, if it will allow. Uh, so desktop one, I suppose. This does this in a slightly different fashion. So hmm. can you see a pyramid with um, mm -hmm. circles all over it? Well, that's not the one I wanted to show. The one I wanted to show was actually this one. Um, not that one, but this one, which is the, um, the great zodiac at Hamat Tavera on the Sea of Galilee. Um, now, this is um, a Nazarene zodiac this is in a synagogue just south of tiberius and um it's said to be third maybe fourth century uh in a jewish synagogue this is a jewish zodiac um i think it's first century because uh if we read josephus josephus says i'm sure he is describing this zodiac so josephus was the army commander in command of galilee and he was sent by the uh, Jerusalem uh, authorities to destroy the images of animals that were four furlongs south of Tiberias. And of course, if you go four furlongs south of Tiberias, you come to this site here, which does indeed have heretical images of animals on it. And so I'm sure he was talking about this zodiac that Josephus Flavius himself was because uh, he was the army commander in command of Galilee, he was told to go and destroy this. Now, this uh, zodiac was owned by Jesus, according to Josephus, Jesus of Gamala, Sophias. Um, but Jesus of Gamala destroyed the synagogue before he could get there, so he couldn't see it. Obviously, people would get into trouble uh, if they found these heretical images of animals. Um, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, um, which shows the difference between Orthodox Judaism down in Jerusalem and the um, Nazarene Judaism of Jesus and James, because I'm sure this Jesus is linked somehow to the biblical Jesus. Um, but just looking at it, it's it's odd. I mean, we have this big zodiac above here. You can't quite see it. Is is the Temple of Jerusalem, um, the Ark of the Covenant, the shofar, all of the accoutrements of Judaism is in the next panel above this one. Um, but in this panel, of course, the central item, <laughs> the central icon, is Helios, the sun god, <laughs> which is deliciously ironic that we have this in the center of a um, Jewish synagogue. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that Helios is a slightly zoomed in version. Helios is holding a blue green spherical earth in his gravitational grasp. And we know this is spherical because the lines of latitude and longitude on it, you can probably see them there, um, are curved, indicating this is on a sphere. Um, and also the sphere is light on one side and dark on the other, which it would be if it was illuminated as a sphere. Um, so we're indicating here that these people had a great deal of astronomical uh, knowledge and astrological knowledge, of course, because they understood the um, heliocentric model of the solar system with Helios, the sun, holding the Earth in his gravitational grasp. So, you know, this is quite complex. This is quite interesting. Um, and so these um, this understanding of, of the cosmos was known in this early era. And a lot of it comes out of Egypt and comes out of Judaism because, of course, the Jews were in Egypt. Um, so they were immersed in this uh, secret and sacred knowledge. And 
this is not the only one, of course. This is um, the zodiac at Hokok, which is sort of northwest of Galilee. Um, it's a bit battered, this one, unfortunately. You can't really see it so well. But anyway, you can see Helios and his four horses here. Um, and this is the zodiac here on the left. So we've got Capricorn and um, Libra, that's the, the scales. And um, Scorpio. Yeah, that's Scorpio, isn't it? With a scorpion sitting there. So that's that's the one at Hokok. And what else have we got? Have we got another one? Have I got another photo? Yes, this is one at this is uh, Sephoris, uh, again, just west of Galilee. And again, we've got um, Helios. This time we've got the sun and the moon in the center. Um, and the uh, constellations around the outside. So th this was widespread knowledge throughout the whole of this region. Um, <clears throat> this one is interesting as well. This is uh, Palmyra. Um, this is the roof. <clears throat> of of the Temple of Bell in Palmyra. <clears throat> um, there was this giant monolith. In the uh, roof uh, of the Temple of Bell. Which um, had the um, the seven planets in the center of surrounded by the um, sign of the Zodiac. And. Um, this was it. When I was in Palmyra, this was a few years back, 2009, I think I was there. Um, <clears throat> one of the last pictures before it was destroyed, because of course ISIS have blown this up. Um, this was um, the roof is one single piece of stone. It's a monolith. Must have weighed in the realms of about 70 tons. And this is the uh, zodiac in the center. Unfortunately, it's all gone now. But um, anyway, that was the extent of their knowledge in the first century. Uh, this again is first century. This is Palmyra. Came to prominence in the first century and lasted through until the third century. Uh, it was destroyed after Queen Zenobia became the, um, the first female emperor of Rome, but only very temporarily. <laughs> she was defeated. So yeah, that's sort of my little introduction to the knowledge that they had. I will stop that. There we go. Now we're back. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts before we carry on. Uh, the uh, if this uh, has been taken as evidence against the apologists idea that Judaism was hermetically, no pun intended, sealed off from all Hellenistic uh, influences. And I, that that is so wrongheaded to begin with because you, you don't have revitalization movements like that of the Hasmoneans unless there is a kind of tidal wave of influence from a different culture. Uh, so uh, if, if to listen to what apologists say, there would have been no occasion for the uh, Maccabean revolt since nobody would have been attracted to, uh, to Hellenism. And they were attracted to it. That's very obvious, even reading the books of the Maccabees. And then on top of that, you had the persecution of Antiochus Epiphanes. But it's not like he had no, uh, no takers for what he was pushing. And, and this kind of thing, I mean... <laughs> Helios and not Jehovah? I mean, come <laughs> on, you know, maybe they thought they were the same. I mean, we know some people thought Zeus or Dionysus was the same as as Yahweh. And uh, it, it's it just really shows a different Jewish world of the time than uh, we uh, le learned about in Sunday school or even seminary, I guess. Yeah, well, they obviously were um, equated. Um, and they probably knew that they were equated because Yah, uh, as in Yahweh, is the Egyptian moon for the moon mm. god. He's called Yah. Um, and the Egyptian um, sun god must be linked with El, Elohim, um, Ella, 
because the Elagabal stone, the sacred Elagabal stone of Syria, which was a, a stone that was, you know, venerated throughout Syria, uh, originally came from Egypt. It was called the Elagabal, which means the mountain of God, Elagabal. Mm. But, but it was also called the Heliogabal, as in Helios. So they were equating, equating L with Helios mm. in the name for the stone. So I, I think they did know that they were uh, linked. Um, and, and this carried on into later years as well. So if we look into uh, later Christianity, if we have, a, again, a quick screen share. Um, this is another uh zodiac well it's not quite a zodiac this is actually a calendar i suppose you could call it um this is a betshian um again on the sea of galilee <clears throat> just south of uh, galilee uh and this is a christian zodiac so this is in the lady mary monastery at betshian mm. and again we can see the same composition but this time it's months of the year instead of signs of the zodiac but of course the two go round and round together in the heavens above um so this is all in uh greek so you can see on the left it says aprilos aprilos maios and then going around to the right side we've got octobrios and <laughs> novembros so we can see this is um months of the year but the interesting thing is in this zodiac of course in the center is we have the sun and the moon. So we have the sun god and the moon god as a man and a woman surrounded by 12 men who are the uh, the monthly constellations of the zodiac. Hmm. So who do we have who is a man and a woman surrounded by 12 disciples? Jesus and Mary Magdalene? Yeah, it's it's got to be Jesus and Mary Magdalene, but this is in a Christian monastery. This is the Lady Mary Monastery on, on the Sea of Galilee. Um, and yet they're being quite heretical here in not only following the Zodiac in the same fashion, uh, but they've also got Jesus and Mary together as the sun and the moon, which wow. they, of course, would have been because that was the sacred marriage in the heavens above. The sacred marriage was the uh, consummation of the sun and the moon during an eclipse because it didn't go unobserved of course to the ancients that the sun and the moon are exactly the same size in the heavens above so when you have an eclipse they entirely cover each other and you get that what do they call it the signet ring the diamond ring as, as the uh, a shaft of light comes out of the side mm. between the uh, sun and the moon during an eclipse uh, and that's a syzygy they call it in astronomy it's it's um, uh, the sun and the moon in flagranti delecto I suppose you could say the sacred marriage in the heavens above and that is what the uh, the leader of the church I suppose you could say the Jesus character was supposed to be doing as above so below as they say in Masonic circles. If it happens in the heavens above, then it should be happening uh, on earth below with the, with the monarch or the priesthood or whoever the person was down below. And so in that case, it was Jesus and uh, Mary Magdalene. So I will be again, done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> exactly the same. Mm. <laughs> yes. mm. Yeah, in masonry, they say as above, so below. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, the what do you make of um, this is old hat now, uh, but um, Ignatz Goltz here did a fascinating job in his book. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, Hebrew myths or Hebrew mythology? I can't remember uh, its its origin and development. He talks about how so many characters, especially early in the Pentateuch. 
are once you know what to look for obvious personifications of heavenly bodies like you, you can't really see samson in any other way i mean his name means the sun and uh, he's uh, burning the crops and uh, and and so forth uh, he kills the the lion like hercules does and with uh, he's got the uh, the rays of the, the sun as the the mane of the lion and so on and so on and then elijah same thing Thing. He, he uh, even rises to the zenith of the heavens in the fiery chariot of Apollo, and he calls down fire from heaven, and he's a hairy man, it says in 2 Kings 1, so that he's got the, uh, the rays projecting the and so on. And the name in Greek, Elias, uh, I was reading in the weirdest place in an old book called The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ, uh, by uh, Levi Dowling. It, it's a strange, uh, interesting book. He says that he has Jesus on the cross calling out for Helios. A and, and why? Well, because the sun has been blacked out and they say, wait a minute, let's see. He's calling for Helios. Let's see if he'll come. Well, that would mean the darkness would subside. Uh, that I read this hundreds of times and that that never occurred to me. But once I read that, I thought, holy mackerel, I don't exactly know what, but this guy's on to something. And, and uh, with Moses, uh, he, he is in the tent of meeting and comes out with the law, just like in, uh, I think it's Psalm 19, uh, the sun is like a, a, a man in his strength coming out from the bridal chamber and and then it goes into the laws and that's the same imagery with Moses and on and on and uh, Esau and uh, Jacob the the sun and the moon the one hairy the other smooth uh, Elijah and Elisha who must be the moon because he's bald like they never tell you what these characters look like unless there's some kind of symbolic uh, or mythic significance and there's so much of this. And, and why the Sabbath, the seven, the, the, the um, seven known planets and so on? It, it's like, I don't know where it stops. Um, some say, well, the whole thing is simply uh, symbolic of astronomy and there's no history to it. I, I, that may be so, I don't know. Uh, but any way you cut it, 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 all this stuff went into a blender. And, and so you find signs of it, whether or not there was a historical Jesus. And I, I wonder if you're familiar with uh, Bruce J. Molina's book, um, The Genre and Message, I think it is maybe it's the message and genre of the book of Revelation, where he, he looks at all of these uh, many uh, ancient astro astrological, astronomical guides and shows how the, the book of Revelation is just permeated with astrological symbolism that, that nobody ever seemed to have noticed. I mean, it's, it's from one end of the Bible to the other. Uh, and it's like, it doesn't mean anything to most of us, so we just discount it, but it meant a lot to them, just like the numerology thing. That just seems like crackpot stuff to us, but we know it was real to them. And so are we, how much are we missing as we read the Bible, I wonder? Uh, quite a lot. Um, I, I don't think it excludes this being real history just because yeah. they're imitating the stars. I think right. uh, that they can do both. And mm -hmm. especially as above, so below, then you are going to mimic um, the movements of the stars in the priesthood and the royal family. So you 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 are one with them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with uh, the Sabbath, that, that comes into some of my writings as well. Uh, see, yes, yeah, Sabbath means the seventh, of course, the seventh mm -hmm. day, etc. But in Egyptian, it means the star. So Saba in Egyptian... Uh, is is one of the main words they use for a star. So when we come across the queen of Sheba, Saba, because it can be um, pronounced both ways, the queen of Sheba is the queen of the stars. Therefore, she is the queen of heaven. Therefore, she is just the same as the book of Jeremiah, where the exiles from Jerusalem are all venerating the queen of heaven in the book of Jeremiah. But who is the queen of heaven? She is the queen of the stars. 
um, she is Isis. So they were venerating Isis. Um, uh, these were Jews, of course, you know, fleeing from mm. Jerusalem, but they were venerating Isis and they refused to give up, even though Jeremiah was, you know, lambasting them and shouting and whatever. Um, but they were probably also venerating a sort of deified um, version of the Queen of Sheba as well, because she also was the Queen of the Stars. That's what it means in Egyptian, the Malka Sheba, the Queen of the Stars. Um, so Isis was obviously a big component of the religion at that time, just as she was, you know, even in the first century. So when Judaism, sorry, when Christianity came along, they couldn't quash the veneration of Isis because she was such a dominant deity. And so they just converted her into uh, Madonna and, and child. So instead of having Isis and Horus, they had Madonna and, Madonna and child. But it was the same symbolism. It was the same veneration. Um, in fact, the statue in the Pantheon in Rome of the Madonna and child is actually Isis and Horus, but they just put a different headdress on <laughs> on the top of her. But it's the same old statue from the Roman mm. era, and they've just reworked it and reused it. So, uh, yeah, this uh, this this veneration of the cosmos above was was very strong, even mm. into the Christian era. What are your thoughts on some of the really bizarre stories in the Bible? that when taken literally make no sense. For example, the story of Elijah and the killing of the 42 boys with uh, two bears. Now, when I looked at this from a literal perspective growing up, it just made no sense. Nobody, nobody in the church could actually explain the story to me. Furthermore, they didn't. They never wanted to discuss the story because it, it didn't make any sense. But from an astrotheological perspective, the story does make sense. Have either of you looked into the, to that story? Yeah, I, though I uh, defer to uh, the expert first. <laughs> um, I, I have, don't... but I haven't taken it in astrological terms, that one. But that would be interesting because, of course, they knew about... Um, Archerus, the uh, it's somewhere in Job, isn't it? Um, I was just trying to look. Um, it must be one of the last chapters. Can you explain why the constellations are as they are? Yeah, it's um, 38 32. Can you bring forth um, Mazaroth? But Mazaroth is the zodiac in his season. Or can you guide Arcturus with his sons, Arcturus being the great bear, of course. Um, in Aramaic, it's um, Ash or Aish, they call it, which is uh, the great bear, Ursa Major. Um, so that's uh, Job 38, 32. Um, and um, yeah, that, that could be what that is talking about. I, I took this a little bit from the uh, Talmud and I came out with a slightly different um, translation because they were talking about bald heads as well. Um, yeah. And I, I made a, a link there to Caesar, but I'm not sure if that's correct because it was a bit sort of um, speculative, you might say. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, Job 8.9 also says, um, which makes Arcturus, Orion, and, and the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Again, that's obviously talking about the zodiac, because the chambers are the houses of the zodiac. Each uh, sign of the zodiac is in a house. Um, and they're using the same phraseology there, that... Um, there are chambers in the south because the zodiac, you normally see it in the south. You don't see the zodiac in the north. Um, so that is astronomically correct. Um, and that's a bit like also in the New Testament. Was it uh, in Luke where um, it says uh, you, you will enter a, a, into the city and there a man shall meet you bearing a pitcher of water? and follow him into the house where he enters. 
quite obviously, I think that's probably talking about Aquarius again, the mm. uh, house or the um, the zone where Aquarius is. Um, that was to Peter and John, wasn't it, in uh, Luke 22? So yeah, they're still talking about uh, the zodiac even there. Um, I think they still do even in um, Judaism to today, don't they? Um, Mazaroth, uh, the, the the common greeting within Judaism is uh, Mazel Tov, hmm. uh, which is uh, you know generally said to mean good fortune, but it actually means good zodiac. Because yeah, that makes comes, sense. Yeah, it comes from Mazara, uh, which is the zodiac, the 12 signs of the zodiac. And it therefore means good fortune because they were fortune telling, the same as Joseph was fortune telling mm. to Pharaoh. And no doubt Joseph was doing the same thing. He was doing that via the zodiac. And so the common greeting is, is Mazel Tov, good zodiac. <laughs> Yeah, they, it doesn't like with the Elijah being Elisha being bald. I figured it had something to do with the 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 uh, the moon and the great and little bears, the the two bears. Why is that? Now, what the kids are, I, I don't know. Uh, are they supposed to be stars, a group of stars, or something? I I, I don't know if I've ever read a complete. Uh, breakdown of this, but it, it does seem to be some sort of astrological allegory, just like the Halal son of Shahar is with the, the morning star and uh, competing with the sun, and it looks pretty uh, pretty uh, big and shiny before the sun rises, but once it does, boom, that's it, and, uh, and, and the whole uh, thing, or in one of the Psalms, if I take the wings of Shahar and fly away with well, the wings of the dawn goddess, but they don't translate it that way for obvious reasons. Mm. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, yeah, well, this is repeated in, in the Talmud, and that's where I was doing my translation from, and I think they were using Pesha, because obviously it comes from the Old Testament, um, but they were retranslating it for the centuries that this was written in, which is mainly about the first century. Uh, and therefore, the children, I thought, would be the children of Israel um, mm. versus the bears. And quite often within the Talmud, the bears is an indication of Rome because, you know, they, they were the great power. Mm. Um, and, and the bald head, the famous bald head was, was Caesar. Uh, go up, you bald head. Um, <laughs> it might be something to do with the Zodiac. I mean, my interpretation of that was very tentative. I don't know. But that... That doesn't explain the Old Testament uh, equivalent, because that, of course, was long before Rome came along. Um, but the Talmudic Mun version of it, they often take verses from the Old Testament and they recast them into uh, current events to try and explain things that are going on in current events. Um, that's standard Talmudic Pesha. Um, hence Is all there... of the, the stories about Elijah and so on, where... Elijah and and, um, and Ghazi appear to be uh, Jesus and Saul. So they've recast those two people uh, into the first century um, mm -hmm. to have, you know, uh, Ghazi as the unreliable, untrustworthy servant of Elijah. And uh, of, of course, Saul was the untrustworthy one in within the New Testament. You know, he was the liar, etc. Um, so they appear to have recast these people into that era, into the first century. Is there an astrotheological understanding of Jesus cursing the fig tree? I've never heard it discussed, but I'm not any expert in this. So, no, I've not looked into that one. But yes, when you when you find these oddities within the New Testament you may well find an underlying meaning to it. Um, don't know. We'd have to look in, into that. Yeah, one I got to yeah. check into that too. I, it's never occurred to me before, but I suddenly thought, well, speaking of weird and embarrassing stories yeah. in the Bible. Uh, oh, boy. 
Um, well, you do get a lot of this uh, symbolism. I mean, it goes back uh, again into the Old Testament when we have the um, the story of uh, Joseph taking his brothers down into Egypt. Mm. And he's saying unto Pharaoh, um, no, he says to his brothers, when you go and meet Pharaoh, don't say your um, shepherds, say your cattle breeders, because sh uh, shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians and you will not be allowed to stay uh, in the lands of Egypt, which makes absolutely no sense in agricultural terms whatsoever. Uh, but of course, if we turn to the zodiac and the procession of the equinox, it makes every sense um, because well, because Taurus had turned into Aries in 1750 BC, that was the reason, um, as far as I'm concerned, that we had the Hyksos shepherd kings, because they were venerating Aries rather than Taurus, the Apis bull. Um, and so what Joseph was saying to his brothers was, when you meet Pharaoh, don't say that you were Hyksos, the Hyksos shepherd kings mm. say mm. that you were Apis bull worshippers because the Hyksos are an abomination to um, to the Egyptians, which of course they would have been because they'd already been kicked out of Egypt on the great Hyksos exodus, which happened in circa 1580 BC. And this was, you know, Joseph coming back down into Egypt, as it explains in the in the gospel story. Um, and so they were trying to come back into Egypt. And of course, they didn't want to be linked with the Hyksos because mm. they'd already had a civil war with the, with the Hyksos. They didn't want to be identified as them, the shepherd kings. But um, this, this um, connection between the sun god and the son of God, yeah, that sort of works in the, um, uh, it doesn't work in the Hebrew, but it does work in the Greek. Um, so you get the, the Helios and the Huios as mm. the sun god mm. and the sun of mm. God. So you, you can you can yeah, you can uh, mix what those two know? and get them muddled up if you wish, if that's convenient for you. Huh. Wow, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm learning stuff today. <laughs> I'd, um, li I'd like to introduce the topic of fish. Oh, fish. Oh, yes. Uh, in particular... John first John chapter 21 uh, where it talks about Jesus uh, and the disciples catching fish in particular the 153 fish is there anything symbolic what exactly does this 153 fish signify well, it was one of the triangular numbers of the Pythagoreans, and I forget what that means, to tell you the truth, but it was a sacred number for them, one of several. And uh, there is, of course, a Pythagorean story where uh, the sage finds a bunch of fishermen with a huge amount of fish already on the shore, and he doesn't want people eating them. Uh, he's a vegetarian, and he says, hey, guys, um, how about this? If I can guess the number of fish, would you promise? us to let them go and I'll compensate you for the market values. Yeah, okay, go ahead. And, and of course, he, he doesn't count them. He just says, oh, there's a so and so number. And uh, sure enough, when they do count them, he's right. And he pays them for the fish. Miraculously, the fish have remained alive and they go back into the water. Well, in the uh, John 21 story, uh, th it doesn't make any difference what the number of fish was. Why is that in there? It's just <laughs> residual from it's left over from the Pythagorean original. And, and it makes no sense in the gospel version, because can you imagine? Uh, you, you guys go in and talk with the resurrected son of God while I count the fish. Uh, come <laughs> on. <laughs> yes, it's, it's an interesting aside. You can always tell within the, you know, the gospel stories and the uh, Old Testament stories if there is something being withheld because it suddenly doesn't make sense and you get details that you shouldn't really be there you know why, why do we have this um yeah 153 is is um a, a 17 triangle um so if you get a, a triangle of numbers and start with number 
one at the top and go all the way down to 17, the bottom row is 153. Mm -hmm. So it's a 17 triangle, but I've got no idea why the number 17 should have been highlighted in that fashion. I don't know. It's, it's still a mystery that I'm still working on. But I think the basic idea of, of them going out and catching fish <clears throat> is that they were catching converts to the great month of Pisces. <clears throat> so Aries had turned to Pisces in AD 10. And so they were trying to change the religion the same as, you know, Joseph was trying to do from bulls into sheep back in the um uh in 1750 bc well he wouldn't have been there but that argument went on for centuries they were still trying to do it even you know a, a century and a half later they were still trying to turn bulls the apis bull into you know veneration of the sheep and they were trying to do the same in in the first century so i think that this is a story about jesus going out on a boat and catching converts to the new great age of Pisces so that people would know about Pisces. And I think his um, meeting out in the wilderness with the 5,000 or the 4,000 is exactly the same. So in that case, they had two fishes and, uh, and, and, and loaves, loaves of bread. Now, um, Bread in the New Testament, as far as I can see, is, is a reference to knowledge. And we get that from the verse about the uh, Greek woman. Um, and, and she goes up to uh, Jesus. Um, I forget what verse that is, actually. Let's have a quick look. She goes up to Jesus and she's looking for... Um, She is looking for a, a miracle from Jesus and, and he sends her away and calls her a dog. Um, and, um, and she turns around and says, well, yes, master, but even the dogs can eat the uh, crumbs from the master's table. And, and that's repeated again in the in Nag Hammadi Gospels. And if you read the Nag Hammadi version, it's quite obvious that they're not talking about bread. They're talking about knowledge. She wants the knowledge that Jesus had and the Nazarene church of Jesus and James. And Jesus sends her away and says, you know, you're a Greek. You're not entitled to this knowledge. And she says, well, yes, but even the dogs can eat or have the crumbs of knowledge from the master's table. I think that's what it is actually talking about. Um, and so if we take that into the loaves and fishes stories, then the bread and the fish becomes the knowledge of the great month of Pisces. Because remember, mm -hmm. Pisces is two fish. That is the constellation of Pisces. Um, it's two fish on the end of two stalks. Um, and of course, after this you know, meeting where we have this instruction about the great month of Pisces, there are 12 baskets left over. Yeah, of course, because there are 12 constellations in the Zodiac. Um, quite obviously, it's, it's talking about the Zodiac and the procession of the equinox once more. And um, this, was, this was the contention, I would say, between the Nazarene and you know, the Judean church within, um, within Jerusalem, you know, the Orthodox church. Um, can you talk to us about the symbolism with the Pope and its relation to fish? I don't know. I've heard people suggest that the mitre is like a, a fish, but I have no idea. Be interesting if it's the case. Well, we have the obvious um, link um, of Christianity, the symbol of Christianity being the fish. Now, why did they choose that? You know, was it really because, you know, Jesus was, you know, had fishermen as his disciples, really? You know, Peter was the um, supposed to be the first of the fishermen. Or was it because this was the great age uh, of Pisces? Uh, I think the symbol of Christianity 
became the fish, just sharing a little image here, mm. um, because Jesus was the first king of the age of Pisces. And of course, that links in with later with Arthurian legend. I know people don't like me talking about Arthurian legend, but of course, within Arthurian legend, we then have the line of the Fisher Kings. Mm -hmm. Why are they Fisher Kings? Well, because this was the age of Pisces. And this image here is is um, an image of um, the Fisher Ring. So the Pope wears the Fisher Ring. Again, it's supposed to be because of Peter being the, you know, the chief fisherman. Um, but, you know, this was the age of Pisces and it links the Pope. This is actually isn't the Pope's one. You can buy these online, actually. This is a, a silver Pope's ring. Um, hmm. The real one has the name of the Pope on the top of it. But, you know, this one obviously doesn't. Um, and the Pope wears the fisherman's ring. Because it was the, of the age of Pisces. Um, and Jesus was the first of the Fisher Kings. And hmm. this is the um, Pope's mitre. And uh, again, yeah, lots of people say that this is a fish mouth mitre, which links Christianity with the fish once more. Um, because this was the age of Pisces. We come back to procession again. Um, you know, previous monarchs. So if we go back into the era before Christianity, when we were in the age of Aries, um, this is Alexander the Great. He identified himself with uh, the Ram because this was the age of Aries. Now, some people say that, you know, this is symbolic of a moon, Amon, um, but he lived in the great uh, month of Aries, as did. Ptolemy the third. This is Ptolemy the third. Well, actually, this is Ptolemy the third as Hercules. But there we go. But again, you can see he's got a ram's horn in his hair hmm. because this was the age of uh, Aries. The, the same as the Hyksos shepherds identified themselves with with sheep because that was the age of Aries, as did the biblical patriarchs. Um, Moses also was supposed to have horns on his head, um, although they're not obviously sheep horns, but, you know, it's the same sort of symbolism. Mm. And, and this is not just a moon because this is, um, this is Leonidas, the mm. Spartan king, um, and he's got ram's horns mm -hmm. because he was identifying with uh, the age of Aries. And I go one stage further. Um, because um, I wrote a little article about, this is the ram they're copying, of course, is the, the, mm. the curly-headed ram, um, that the Ionic capitals, because we have the three orders of uh, capitals from Greece, and one of them is the Ionic. And I looked at the Ionic uh, order and thought, well, you know, are they venerating here the um, age of Aries again? Are these horns of a ram? Not leaves. Uh, they're normally said to be um, leaves of, I forget which plant, but anyway, that curl around. I think these are probably horns of a ram. Hmm. Um, and so they were honoring again the age of Aries. And so this is all a veneration of the... Um, procession of the equinox um why were they so interested in it well as i said at the beginning you can identify your era um with the sign of the zodiac that you're following so if you're following aries you must be somewhere between 1750 bc and uh, zero bc basically when it turned into pisces you can identify with that particular age and so now we're in the age of uh, pisces and christianity is all identified with the fish uh, and eventually we'll get to um aquarius because we're at the dawn of the age of aquarius as the song said um, and no doubt everyone will be identifying with with water and, and water carriers um, a bit like in um 
Acts of the Apostles. What did it say? He's poured out this, which you see in here. Yeah, and, and follow him to the house. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you shall meet a man bearing a pitcher of water, and you will follow him into the house where he enters. Yeah, well, that sounds very much like the house of the Zodiac. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, in which Aquarius lies. Mm. So, oh, it sounds very much like that. So I think that's what they were talking about. Mm. But this is a sort of forgotten part of Judaism and, and Christianity. Christianity has forgotten it. They will not um, admit that, uh, that the fish symbolism of Christianity is something to do with Pisces and in Judaism they will not admit that early Judaism Nazarene Judaism venerated the Zodiac and yet they found you know six or more of these um, Zodiacs um, across Judea let's have a quick reminder of that if I share screen again so we've got at least six of these we've got um we've got hukok oh i'm not sharing am i there we go now i'm sharing we've got hukok with the big zodiac there um we've got um the, the lady mary that's a christian one we've got this one beth alpha we didn't see this one before this is beth alpha this is a bit of a crude uh, one. You can't really get much information from this. But again, you know, it's, it's in a synagogue and they were venerating Helios in the center. It's a bit symbolic, representational, but there we go. And the signs of the Zodiac. Um, we've got, uh, oh, this comes out of Egypt, of course. This is the Dendera Zodiac. Um, so at the temple of Dendera, this is a Ptolemaic uh, temple down in Egypt and they've got this magnificent zodiac in the roof it's now mm. in the Louvre so you've got to go to the Louvre to see the real one mm. um, but this one is not just a zodiac but it's processional again you can see the procession of the equinox um, so the the main axis um, is between um, Aries and Pisces you can see here that's the main axis that gives us a date. That date is AD 10. Um, and we can see that again on the um, Hamat Tavera one. Again, you see the head of Helios is pointing between Aries and Pisces. That's not just a fashion. That's not just a symbol. That's a date. And in processional terms, that is AD 10 between the uh, great months of Aries and Pisces. And that's why I say that Josephus could well have been sent to destroy this zodiac um, because it was a first century zodiac. And in fact, just after I was there, um, a party of Orthodox Jews came up from Jerusalem with pickaxes uh, to destroy this zodiac. Because just like Josephus back in the first century, who was trying to destroy it because it had heretical images of animals on it. They came up from Jerusalem with pickaxes and started picking this thing to destroy it. Um, this was uh, about 10 years ago. And luckily they were captured <laughs> before they had made too much of a mess of it. And they were able to put it back together again. But it shows how contentious these Zodiacs are. Even today, people are trying to destroy them because wow. they don't accord with with classical you know orthodox uh -huh. judaism but, rewrite uh, the past yeah it's completely they're just following the past yeah exactly the same um so yeah anyway that's i'll stop sharing that it's just interesting how how this is denied and not acknowledged so when i found this and i started writing about this um uh my king jesus book i forget when this was it was i don't know back in 2008 2010 or something the only way i found out about the zodiacs was from a chinese paper <laughs> so i mean this was sort of pre-internet days uh, or at least i hadn't found it on the internet and i found a, a paper by a chinese scholar 
who wrote about the zodiacs of Judea. And I thought, what? <laughs> you have to be joking, surely. But no, I looked it up and finally I found that, yes, these zodiacs did exist. And I went to Hamat Tavera. And of course, there it is. I mean, it's not it's not secret. You can buy your ticket and you can go in there and you can go and visit. No problem at all. But nobody writes about it. So you won't find any information about wow. these zodiacs unless you're really, really looking for it. Um, and so it's hidden in plain sight, basically. It's there, but wow. you really got to go looking for it. Mm. Mm. 